Hello and welcome back to another edition of 5 Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with is Chuck Hodges. So Chuck, can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, thanks for having me. This is it's really fun to be chatting about this stuff. Uh, I am a professor of instructional technology at Georgia Southern University in Statesboro, Georgia, which is not too far from Savannah. I teach in the instructional technology program. Most of our students are in-service teachers, usually in Georgia, working on a master's or maybe an EDS. All right, so Chuck, over the years I know that you've been involved in and, and paying attention to the world of K-12 online learning and um, have seen how things have evolved, particularly at the district level in, in, in Georgia. We've got a real disruption that's happened in the school year this year, and um, you know, administrators, school leaders aren't able to sort of end the school year, begin the school year like they would normally do. So what advice would you give them to uh, help accommodate some of the disruption that's happened? Well, I, uh, we, we do, you mentioned the uh, K-12 online learning. That's not what I would consider a research area for me but I do certainly have to be aware of it because it is a, is a big deal. I work in rural schools a lot and they reach out and do a Georgia virtual school for some of their AP offerings and stuff pretty frequently. And our program has a uh, endorsement in online teaching that's Georgia certified. So we, we kind of keep an eye on that, even if we're not the experts. Um, one real issue for us in, in my area, which is very rural, has been access to the internet. Uh, the schools themselves uh, have an abundance of devices, usually. Uh, they're, most of the schools around me are approaching one-to-one -one with usually Chromebooks, some iPads, and that was mostly driven by the state testing. They had to have approved devices to take the test on. So they're approaching one-to-one, -one, but it doesn't do the, the students much good to take them home because there's a, a pretty significant number who don't have internet access other, other than maybe a smartphone. Uh, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it's, uh, it's so significant that the county that I'm in, when the pandemic hit, they didn't cancel school. You know, They canceled physical schools. They closed schools physically but they didn't send the devices home with the students because they wouldn't, a lot of them wouldn't have access. So they made digital materials available for those who could have them. They made packets that could be picked up at the students' schools if they wanted them to keep everything um, kind of fair. They weren't requiring or grading anything. So a lot of the schools around here basically ended around mid-March. Um, Savannah Chatham is a district to my east and they actually from what I can tell I don't work with them but from what I've been able to snoop around and find online they actually do have a digital learning model that seems to be working and in a few instances they have people where they can pick up packets but a lot of the rural districts around me the online option just isn't an option uh, for People who have asked me advice, I have talked a lot about doing synchronous instruction versus asynchronous instruction, but that's a big question. You know, obviously we're meeting here today in a video conference thing together, but I have kind of pushed them away usually from synchronous meetings simply because of that access issue. Uh, students may be able to travel, may, maybe their parents will take them out to a, a few designated locations where there are Wi-Fi hotspots. They've got some school buses that are traveling around, you know, certain hours that have Wi-Fi. So definitely talking about uh, asynchronous options instead of synchronous things. Um, that's one thing I've talked about. And then uh, the use of video, just in general, whether it's whether someone has full internet access or not, I tend to be not a fan of the lecture, like the traditional lecture, 
and talking head video, you know, for a five minute interview like we're doing is kind of fun, but for a 90 minute class is not a great thing. So I've talked a lot about, you know, what would be appropriate uses of video, giving kind of feedback on assignments, giving instructions on assignments and talking about common errors or just doing, um, you know, announcements and things like that to add, add a little bit of yourself into the class and to provide that connection back with the teacher, but not to rely on just, you know, long lectures, certainly. Okay. Um, thinking ahead to next year, there's a strong likelihood, that, you know, the nature of pandemics, there's going to be a second wave. We might have local flare-ups as things start to open up in different states. So there's a good chance that at least individual school districts, in some cases maybe full states or the entire country again, may have to shut down. What can school leaders do now to help prepare their schools, their staffs, uh, their teachers, and their students to be ready to make it a little bit more seamless next time instead of sort of the abrupt fashion that it happened this time? Yeah, abrupt is, is a good description. It happened like crazy fast. It, it was it was one day, you know, it's schools are closed to do some planning, and the next it's, okay, we're going fully online or you know, in other cases, kind of doing what you can. Um, I sure hope that the schools around here are taking advantage of this time to get their teachers some instruction and some professional development about K-12 online learning. Um, one big thing for me is to help them with uh, appropriate types of assessments. Um, let's not do digital worksheets or uh, online multiple choice test all the time, you know, f figure out some, some good project based stuff, um, focus on things that can be done around the home um, so that students don't have to have access to a lot of the materials in a school. And that's, that's what I hope they're doing. And then kind of on the technology infrastructure side, um, let's figure out if, if you did send those devices home with students, let's preload them with some things so that they don't have to have access to the internet all the time. You know, Chromebooks can have stuff loaded on them that is somewhat usable without the internet. And maybe when they get out to hit those access points, you know, it can be more of a download and go type of thing rather than just, you know, sit there in the parking lot and use the internet for a while. All right, perfect. Well, thank you very much, Chuck. So this has been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning With, and today our with has been Chuck Hodges. Thanks very much for having me.